recorded. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who is that? And you shall receive. <laughs> yeah, he can just throw away the link if we decide we don't want it, but um, maybe somebody um, has it, isn't able to attend and it might be good. That's wonderful. Didn't know it was possible. <laughs> have someone named Patricia Knight that keeps trying to get in and when I say admit it won't allow her in. Is she part of your club or? Yes. yes. There must be some yes. technical problems on her side. Can one of us write her if we know her and let her know to try a different device maybe? Okay. Um, I can e try to email her. Or Ellen. Hello, Ellen. <laughs> yes, email or text her. Well, I don't know if she has a... Whatever she's got. Okay. Okay, I think it's a good time to uh, go ahead and, and start getting in. I'm sure there's going to be more people coming in. Good afternoon. And, and welcome to the, the historical first uh, Garden Club of Los Altos meeting on Zoom. So um, I'm so happy that everybody who's here is joining us and I think we're probably gonna get quite a few more folks coming in. Um, I don't know about you, I spent my morning out in the garden enjoying it and doing a lot of watering of plants because I think we're gonna have a really, really hot day today. And uh, I hope you've all been enjoying your garden and staying healthy and, and safe out there. And I want to especially thank um, Grace for getting this set up and Chris uh, Glossarian for getting the information out to everybody so that everybody can get in and uh, enjoy this program. Um, my name is Nancy Shardell. I'm the new president of the Garden Club of Los Altos. Little did I realize when <laughs> I was taking on this responsibility of what a complicated time it would be with the Garden Club and trying to do our uh, different events with being under lockdown. So it's an interesting time for all of us, I know. And now I'd like to turn over the meeting to Grace, our vice president and uh, we will talk about the uh, speaker and introduce him. Um, so since you're replying, um, since you're on this, I think you probably read all about Dave and the little blurb we sent out, so I won't repeat that. And I just like to say he's our beloved teacher at Foto College Horticulture, and I think he's been there for 20 years, or is it more? Uh, close to 200. <laughs> Yeah, I know he feels like that. He, he claims he secretly hates us all, but we know he loves us all. <laughs> so we learned, I mean, if you um, talk to anybody in horticulture in this area and up and down the peninsula, they've been, they've had a class or many classes with Dave and maybe had a tomato thrown at them. <laughs> But anyways, no. we're so glad that he's <laughs> able to join us. He's absconded with our hearts to Portland, Oregon, if you can imagine. But we'll, he'll live on. Um, I have a question. I have a person named Susan Eaton trying to get in. She says it's, there's a message on her thing saying uh, the host is, uh, we are waiting for the host to open the meeting. I resend her, the, do you see her? Susan I, Eaton. I, I don't see her name on the list of participants. Okay, I'll send her the link again. Thank yeah, you. Send her the link again, and unless she's on, under somebody else's computer, I guess not. Okay, I have a question before we get started, Grace or David. Um, this I'm a very novice at all of this, also. So do I, up on the right-hand corner, when you start your talk, do I go under speaker view then? Uh, um, no, you probably can just, uh, I'll mute everybody so I can talk. And then if anybody has a question, uh, in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you should see a little microphone that probably has a, like a stop symbol through it. 
you click on that, then I can, uh, or then you can ask me a question or speak to me. You just have to remember if you're not muted, uh, when you say something or something happens in the background, then everybody hears it. So it can get distracting after a while. So when you start, then will, will, the, will the gallery disappear and it'll just be your program or how does that um, yeah, you'll, you'll still see the pictures if you have those turned on, but the main screen will be filled with the PowerPoint that I have prepared for you. Perfect. And you'll hear, you'll hear my voice in the background, so. But up at the top of my screen, there's a thing that says speaker view. So if you wanna see a bigger speaker, you can click right. on that and go out of this gallery view into that one where you see the speaker more. Yeah, and that you'll look at about five of the little gallery pictures. Yeah, so that was my question. So we need to do that is go into speaker view. We don't need to see everybody else's picture, you, right? No, you don't have to see everybody else. So whenever somebody asks a question, usually their camera pops up or their name pops up. So okay. well, most people say I have a face for radio, so you may not want to look at the speaker view <laughs> either. <laughs> okay, are, are we ready to start? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to mute you. So if you have questions, just feel free to chime in and I'll save a little bit of time towards the end. And again, I appreciate the chance to uh, see you folks. Uh, I saw you about a year ago during your scholarship uh, presentation. And again, thank you very much for your support for the horticulture program. Um, again, this is the first time I think I've spoken to the Los Altos Garden Club. I know I've done a few others uh, and that it really varies. Don't be distracted if I look to the upper right every once in a while and people will try to get in. That's where I have to look to admit them. But but anyway, this is kind of a new technology for me. Uh, again, I'm, I'm retiring in to the end of June and I was hoping to slide through my last quarter at Foothill kind of easily, but no, can't, can't work out that way. And I am in Portland now. I moved up here and I'm homeschooling my grandchildren and teaching my classes from up here. So it is a, it's a different spring, uh, certainly for everybody. Uh, I hope you're all healthy. I hope you're surviving and enjoying the gardening. That's one thing you can do without, uh, without quarantine, I know. Now, what I, what I was going to talk about today, I have in a PowerPoint and I have several uh, slides. Uh, it may be too long to get to everything in the class today. Uh, if it is, uh, I have sent, uh, a PDF of this presentation to Grace and she can send it out to all of you. So if you want it or didn't get to see it, uh, also I'm recording it. So hopefully it, uh, it'll be available afterwards and I can send that link to her for a while. Uh, what I hope to talk about was sort of the design process and I was going to put an emphasis on plants because I know most of you are plant lovers. Uh, if you had a choice for a garden, it'd be filled with plants rather than decorative paving. So I, I'm going to mention paving, but it's, it's just part of the overall design uh, scheme. But I'm going to try to put an emphasis on uh, planting ideas. And as a landscape architect, uh, which I'm trained as, uh, this is how we approach a project and what we think of and sort of the steps that we go through to come up with, hopefully, will be a, a good answer. And they're all steps that you can uh, initiate and use on your own. Uh, they're not difficult. Uh, I've told my students that there are some people that just have a knack. They can go out, they can pick plants and put them in. They work great. Uh, it's more like exterior decorating. But for most of us, we literally have to think about what we're doing. We have to have some steps to go through. <laughs> and if we don't learn these steps, uh, the chances of making mistakes uh, go up. So I'm going to start the PowerPoint presentation here and we'll uh, see how it goes. And again, if you have questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask. So again, it's, it's a landscape design, uh, the basics of preparing a landscape design uh, with an emphasis on plants. And again, the, as I mentioned, it, it is a process. It's something that we just don't randomly uh, pull out of our heads and, and do. You can see there are several steps to it. Uh, they're very similar to any problem solving process and that we have to kind of think about the problem, look at it before we start solving it. Uh, our process as landscape architects and designers 
is a little bit different than maybe architects or engineers or some of the other people that use uh, step programs to solve things. Again, we do start out with an analysis, looking at the site, developing a program. We do those uh, dreaded bubble diagrams, which we call conceptual design. And again, what we're trying to do there is just find out what has to be on the site, where does it have to be, and about how big does it have to be. And again, if we follow this step properly, then we don't end up with gardens in the wrong spot and patios in the wrong spot. We can get them in, and it's very easy to make changes in this space so we can study different creative ideas. Once we've got an idea or two that we think works, we then go to schematic design. And we apply uh, what I call form composition to bubbles. This is where we start to uh, make them a little bit more articulated uh, with circles, with diagonals, with squares or rectangles. We try to take the outdoor living areas, paths and planting areas and apply some form to that. And then we turn the bubbles that were for plants and turn those into trees, ornamentals, large shrubs, uh, perennials, decorative grasses. Uh, notice in my scheme, uh, I don't say start picking plants here. What I tell my students to do is if you're going to design and not get confused by the you know, tens of thousands of choices you have in California, you know, start with the trees that are the most, or the plants that are the most limiting first. And that's usually the trees, the existing trees and proposed trees. And then work your way down by size. Because by the time you get down to perennials and decorative grasses, you might have 10 or 15 of them on the site, but you probably have a couple thousand to choose from. On the other hand, with trees, you don't have that many to choose from. So you're going to start with a limiting number and work your way down by plant size. I also have them develop a plant list and identify some alternative choices for each plant. And then when we get to the detailed design part, we already know what plants we're gonna use and we know the names of some plants, so we can start to specify uh, individual plants. We can also pick out the hardscape materials we're gonna use and get some approximate dimensions for those. And then lastly, we put together our master plan. We draw up the hardscape, we draw up the plant locations, uh, we prepare our planting plan uh, in a way that you know is going to be uh, possible for uh, a contractor or anybody who's you know trying to read our plan to install it. And again, sometimes it's simply plants. Other times it might be uh, plants and hardscape. But whatever you're designing, again, down at the end, we have to have some kind of plan to follow. So. Uh, I can quickly go through the first couple of steps. You've probably done analysis before, before. You probably just haven't thought about it. You look at your site and think about where are the sunny areas? Where are the shady areas? Where is it wet? Where do I have drainage problems? Where is it very dry? And we expand that to look at a site where, where might you have uh, good views? Where might you have uh, things you want to screen? Do you have uh, plant material problems? Do you have erosion areas? Okay, so we're looking at several things related to the site. And we always want to document these on what we call a base map or a base plan. Because if we have that documented and we take photographs and, and we, you know, get good information, it makes our design work easier. We don't have to continually guess, you know, what did we actually see when we were out there? And we also, you know, here's an an example, uh, you can see uh, a project in Palo Alto that I did. Again, we prepared a base plan for the house, the site, what was there. We took photographs of what it looked like to begin with. And again, it's, you know, as, as designers, we identified, you know, what do we want to keep? What do we want to take out? What works? What doesn't work? And again, it, in this particular case, this is the first time in my history of designing in California, I actually saved the Hollywood Jennifer. Usually it's not one of my favorite plants, but it was such a dominant plant. Uh, we pruned it up so you could see more of the house. But again, you'll identify things like this when you're going through and doing a critical uh, look at the house. On the other hand, we didn't care much for the hedge, some of the other smaller plants. So you'll see later on uh, the end result. We particularly noticed the entrance was under scale. There was a little tiny walkway going up. It was hard to find. There was no 
way to sit out in front and you know watch people passing by. It, it was uh, here's a detailed look at it. It was just underdeveloped, okay, in just about every way. We also sit down and meet with the client. We do an interview. We do a after site visit. We um, try to identify any problems. We talk about things with the client. What do they like? What don't they like? And I, I basically ask for problems and I ask for potentials. I ask what kind of plants do they like? I ask what do they want to do outside? I mean, do they have spaces where they want to entertain at? Do, do they have children? You know, what are they doing with the outside? Because each one of those questions, when they get answers to it, that's going to turn into one of the bubbles that I use in my conceptual design. If they tell me they have kids, I, I may decide to put in a turf area. If they tell me they have, you know, large parties quite often. My outdoor living area is going to be a little bit bigger than if they say, no, we only eat outside every once in a while. You know, if they want an outdoor kitchen, if they want a swimming pool, if they want a hot tub, you know, if they want a vegetable garden, if they want a flower garden, I need to ask these questions to find out, you know, what do they do with their site? Because if I know this, then I can move to the next step of the design where I'm going to start to look at, you know, the, the design in particular. And this is the step we call the conceptual design. And you can, you may have seen this from somebody before, you may not, but what we're doing is we're just going through and on the site, we're not being real specific or real detailed. What we're saying out here in this area, we need something like an enclosure and a screen. Up here, we need some privacy. We need some privacy. And they have some color they want. They want this to be a focal point. They want to hide utilities. And you can see the things that we're doing with this is we're taking all those areas they said they needed outside, both plants and hardscape. We're trying to create a bubble form that's in the right location, approximately the right size. It may be off a little bit and approximately the correct configuration. You know, obviously if they said they wanted the tennis court right here and it doesn't fit, you know, I can address that right away. But if they say they want an enclosure and a screen, well, it could be a fence, it could be plant material. But if it's something in this area, I've got the size about right, the configuration can be flexible, and I've got the location correct. Here's a couple examples of some rough concepts that we've worked on in the past. And you can see they're, they're not very detailed designs yet. We're just playing around with you know, masses of trees and, you know, where we might have walls and walkways and, and you know, where we might have ground cover. You, you couldn't build anything from these plants, but I can look at this and say, okay, this is what the client told me. They want something kind of free flowing. You know, they, they want some buffer plants out in front. They want uh, some circulation up to the house. Same thing on this one, circulation, different doorways, you know, slopes where they might have existing trees. Again, when we do conceptual design, we're just trying to get what they need somewhere on the site, okay, with approximately the right uh, location and uh, configuration. After that, we start to move into schematic design. The big change on schematic design is you can see that if they had a bubble here that says patio, okay, it now has a form to it. It's got squared off corners. Okay? Back here, where they said they wanted a screen, okay? it now has three tall plants, several lower plants in it. Over here, where they wanted shade, it now has some taller plants and some shorter plants. Where they wanted color and privacy, okay? we, we turned that into individual plants in here. Still no names yet. Okay, still no names because I, I want to be flexible enough to say, well, it might be best to do this with a bunch of medium-sized shrubs, or maybe I should put a whole row of taller shrubs in here. And I can still change these spaces around, but I at least know what their function is. And I'm starting to get closer and closer to saying this should be a big planting bed out here. It should be a mass of plants. I'm also going to begin a list of plants at this point. So when I'm looking at this, I know that, you know, for this site, 
it'd be best if I used uh, X tree and Y tree and Z tree. It's best if I use a list of perennials that come from this. Quite often, when I'm picking plants, I'll, I'll base it on, you know, does the site very hot and dry? Is there a lot of shade there? Does the plant want plants that are native? Do they want things that are very decorative? Do they want a very colorful palette? Out of the thousands of plant material, I can start to develop a list of, you know, anywhere from 10 to a few hundred plants that might fit the bill for what they're asking for. You remember that patio in this scene before had some form, as did the front walk and these beds around here. Well, we're trying to apply a logical uh, form to our design at this point. Now, there are some rules when we're doing form design. Usually we want to have a dominant form. We're going to use something that's pretty much square, rectangular, something that might be rounded or an ellipse, something that has an angle to it, something that might be diagonal, or something like this that might be freeform or curvilinear. And what we try to do is we try to take this form and apply it to each of the areas where we might have hardscape. So you can come back here and you can see if we use the, the square form, oops, uh, that's applied to the walkway. It comes at an angle. It's applied to the patio. Okay? But then we decided to contrast all the squares that we were putting in with sort of a free form line. So we not only have a dominant form, but we have a subordinate form that we're using in here. All the beds inside here are kind of free flowing. The edge of the bed is free flowing, but we still have the, the form of the square and rectangle going. So when we start to get into the schematic design phase, we're not only getting more detailed on the plants, we're also getting more detailed on the hardscape and the shape of the planting beds. Here are a couple examples of designs that we're applying form composition to. This one right here, this is the same one that we saw right here. Notice this S-shaped curve in, and everything else is kind of jumbled together. But when we get down here, we articulated that into a nice wall out here. We echoed it with a wall over here. We added an entryway, some steps up, a patio out here in the front. This walkway went down to the driveway, and you can kind of see that shape shape and form is repeated at several spots throughout the design. This really helps with design principles, particularly the one of unity, where you're trying to make the design look coherent. If you have an overall form composition and you use that uh, to place hardscape, to place plants, okay, it, it makes your design feel stronger. Over here, same design or same site, but a different form composition. This one is all based on circles and radius of circles. You can see how it was used out here. You can see how this row of plants, this row of plants, this row of plants, they all picked up on that same kind of arced theme. Even in the back, you can see the terrace was laid out. Even this little section here, it's laid out with the center of the radius right in here with arcs coming around. Now, not everything fit into the circle. Some of the things ended up being straight rows, but whenever possible, we tried to take that form and use it to guide the placement of plants and the placement of our hardscape. Here's another one, the same terrace. On the left, we had more of a curve theme going with the wall coming around and the steps being curved, leading to an upper terrace, and it was all fit inside of an area. Over here, we use more of an angular theme. The same general area, but over here, the same steps, you know, had an indented part with a couple planters in here, a, a square fire pit. This had a rounded fire pit. So again, the plants would follow the form composition, the hardscape would follow that. When it comes to taking plant material and making it into a schematic design, you can see we started here with uh, a concept, kind of a you know, bubbles 
Then we had an area for tall screen, low accent, a lot of color, turf. And then we converted it from bubbles into individual plants. We wanted some trees, some perennials, some shrubs, some ornamental trees. And then over here, we started going through and identifying what each category of the plants were. So we knew perennials, shrubs, ornamentals, trees, the key over here. We started selecting plants and we did it first using cultural requirements. Some people think you start with aesthetics, of, uh, but my opinion, you have to start preparing your list to, based on the cultural requirements. If you have a plant that's going very strongly against the cultural requirements, there's a good chance it won't live. So you'll never see the aesthetic value of it. So without a lot of extra work, um, you probably want to make sure that you have, you know, the cultural requirements considered first. Sun, shade, water, uh, soil pH, texture, disease, maintenance, pest problems, invasive. Again, there are many things you want to consider okay, underneath your cultural requirements and limitations. When it comes to arranging plants using aesthetic techniques, there are five basic ones. Rowing, grouping, massing, banding, and specimen. And then there's some other additional techniques you can use that are subsets of these. Uh, for these techniques, rowing, very simply lining up similar species, okay, to emphasize a focal point. You've seen this with street trees, with trees along drives, with alleys. Um, even hedges leading up to the driveway or pathways through a, a, a garden. Grouping is probably our dominant planting species. Again, grouping can be looked at in a number of ways. Grouping usually has a focal point plant. It has a matrix plant that fills in the spaces. And then it has some scattered plants that try to uh, create some interest in a you know, little step down from the impact plant. And when we create groupings, we usually create a hierarchy that if it's out in the lawn somewhere, the tall stuff goes in the center, medium sized stuff goes around that, and the lower plants go around the outside edge. But if we're up against the wall, the tall stuff is in back, medium size around the edge, shorter plants in front. There's some techniques for grouping that we can use. One is called block, where you're just using masses of the same kind of plant, okay, to create uh, planting beds. And again, this can be great for color. It's easy to spot weeds, but it does require more maintenance. Okay, you're going to have to constantly swap the plants out. Okay, it has its uses, but usually on large sites. This is an example uh, of blocking. And I know you've probably done this before, you've probably seen it, but you also know great impact, but it does have some work involved. This is the most common one, a mixed border, where you're mixing plants and decorative grasses of different size. It's a little healthier for the environment because it attracts more beneficials. Color's a key component. Works great with a backdrop, okay? And then the mixed border, where you have a mixture of small shrubs, grasses, different kinds of perennials, usually is what gives you most of your garden framework. Sort of a, an alternative to the, uh, uh, to the block planting is drift planting. This is like a block, except it's mixed species, and they're planted in elongated rows. Again, it's a little healthier for the variety or for the environment. It gives you a little more variety. Okay? And it's basically planted like this, where you have uh, sort of inordinate masses of plants that overlap each other. Again, you can see how the colors and the textures interweave with each other. And then there's just randomized or matrix. This is where your plants are all mixed together. This is great for attracting uh, beneficials. Uh, it hides weeds very well. It's a mixture of color, a mixture of texture, okay? And it can be used in many different cases. It has its biggest impact on large sites, but it will work on uh, even smaller areas if you have the 
wherewithal. And again, you see meadows, mixtures of uh, wildflowers, California natives. These things all make, um, they all make nice uh, randomized plantings. Massing is when you have a large group of plants, primarily for a screen, okay, and they're used to create space. They're used to block views off. And again, it can be low, uh, uh, low areas. It can be tall areas, uh, just something that's uh, mixed up. Uh, banding is one you've used that you probably didn't think about. It's when you have a group of mixed plants in back, but you're planting a common ground cover in front of it to help tie all these uh, disparate plants together. You've seen this where somebody's gone to a nursery, this plant was blooming, they bought this, they came back later, this plant was blooming, they bought that, this plant was blooming, they bought that, planted it, and after a while they've got five or six plants, they wonder why doesn't it look like the nursery? Well, the nursery probably had a mass of plants, not just the one. Well, you can fix that by putting a common a ground cover or edge around it so that you can tie them together, make them look like they're a mass. Again, here you can see that banding technique in use, you know, and it's a very strong technique to use in gardens. And then, of course, you have specimen planting, where you pick out something, it's going to be a focal point, and you're going to put in just, you know, one of them or a small group of them. It's something that's going to attract attention. And you can use any part of the plant. You know, sometimes it's the foliage, you know, whether it's exfoliating or a deformed foliage. Sometimes it's a spring color. Sometimes it's fall color. Sometimes it's the berries. Sometimes it's the flowers. But you're going to plant these in small groups or as individuals. And they're just meant for people to look at it, to attract attention, to move the eye in a certain direction. Now, the detailed design is where we're going to go in and we're going to start picking materials. Again, so I go in, I start to look at the various choices I have for hardscape. You know, what kind of structures do I want to use? Do I want certain styles? You know, I can pick lighting, fencing, paving, uh, walls, fences. I can go through and I can develop a, a vocabulary of all of these. I can also do the same thing with plants. I know what plants I want to put where. I've already thought about the cultural requirements. I have my list of plants that are going to fit for each one of these beds. So now I go back and since I've already used the cultural requirements to make my selection, I now go back and I use aesthetic requirements. And those aesthetic requirements include form, color, texture, and line. And line, not so much, but form, color, and texture. So what I do is I'm going to go back and turn that kind of black and white planting plan with the different groups with some names on it into individual plants. Okay, I'm getting towards my plant specimen. Okay, and I'm going to use form first, color second, texture third. I don't worry about line because that's just completed by uh, where two beds come together. And then I'll also think about things like seasonal interest, uh, architectural elements, architectural interest, but those would be secondary. Uh, people don't believe me that doing planting design is one of the biggest challenges that they'll face as a designer. But not only do you have to think about what purpose is it going to serve, where does it go, will it survive, what does it look like, is it different from the seasons, you know, does it have a special purpose? There are so many things to look at with so many choices that it really takes practice to be a good planting design. With form, we're going to be looking at you know, the general shape of the plant. Usually I try to match that design theme that I have, the, the form composition, but I may also choose to contrast it. Okay? If I'm very formal, I'll pick something out of the column or pyramidal. But if I want to go very natural looking, I can do irregular or rounded. With color, I have to study the U, the value, how saturated it is, the sequence, and again, where I'll get the color from. And there are several color schemes I can use. These gray bars indicate I can pick colors next to each other for monochromatic. I can pick two next to each other for analogous, across the color wheel for complementary. I can split them up for complement, split complementary. 
there are a lot of different color schemes. And again, if I'm going to pick something with flowers that are this color, I know it'll work better than if I pick something with this color and one of these other colors. The texture, I usually pick last. For protect, texture usually works best when you're up close to the plant. When you get up next to something, you can see the size of the leaves. And you can tell this has a finer leaf, a broader leaf. Same thing with the fern and the hosta. Yeah, here's a oak leaf hydrangea okay, with a, a liriope and a rubus pentalobus. You know, a really nice contrast of coarse, you know, fine, medium textures. And then line is just created by the boundaries between planting mass, usually between pavement and plants and turf or ground covers and plants. And again, this line will work towards your, your uh, form composition you have. Rectilinear, okay, curvilinear, be very angled, okay, you're going to use that. And if I can, I'll come back and try to create some seasonal interest, you know, same plant in all four seasons. Uh, I tell my students they succeeded if I can go back to a project every three months and it looks different. Okay, something is blooming, something is uh, giving me fall color, something is different about it. So all different parts of the plant, okay, can give me that seasonal interest. And then lastly, I prepare my master plan, okay, my final design. You can see I have labels on plants. Uh, I'll label what the hard uh, scape is, and I have some approximate dimensions. Now, this is that one we've been kind of following through with the curve linear front yard. So if I do a good job, here's my hardscape plan. Here's my planting plan. And then that same project you're looking at before and after. So the backyard, by using the process, Again, it, you know, this is what it looks like now. This is what it looked like when we started. The front entry, we took out the hedge and the walkway. This is what it looked like when we started. This is what it looks like now. So if you've done a good job, the before and after pictures that you take should work pretty well. You, know, you can pat yourself on the back that you've done a, a good job with the design. Now, I've already gone a little bit past two o'clock. You guys have questions or? I know uh, someone did send in a picture asking what could they do here? They can see right into the neighbor's area. Well, I know uh, it's almost two narrow of a space to try to plant in here, but a space like this, you know, the process tells me I, I need circulation. You know, I want a screen here, and my options are probably going to be more, you know, something like putting in an extension on the fence and, and something where I can Maybe grow some vine. Yeah, grow some vines or something like that up here. And again, if I really want to get fancy, I'll, I'll take my what I'm building here and I'll maybe you know add some lines and arc it over. And I can enclose this so I can get my vines to grow up and over the top. You know, and I can do uh, a couple things with this. I can then, you know, emphasize my walkway down through here, make it a little bit nicer. You know, I can screen the views out this way, and I prevent people from seeing in this direction. And again, I've done techniques sort of like this before, where these are just metal pipes with curved pieces at the top, and you run wires uh, from one pipe to the next, and you come down and you can get vines to grow up there because they they don't take up a lot of space at the bottom, but they get to give you a lot of, you know, vertical growth. So you just, you know, that there are several keys to being a good designer. One is knowing a process. 
Another is uh, working on creativity techniques. I teach my students how to look through magazines, how to take field trips, how to brain share with others, how to, you know, I guess ideate, if you will, you know, how to uh, look at what other folks have done. Uh, there are a lot of different ways uh, to learn new design techniques and learn new design objects. Uh, there's nothing wrong with looking at somebody else's design and seeing an idea they like. Uh, the important thing is, you know, write it down, catalog it. And then when you reach a situation that's going to be the same as that, you can pull that book out and you can say, oh, yeah, this might work here. Okay. After you do that a few times, you'll find you, you know, you're actually pretty good at doing design because you've got a catalog in your mind that helps you be creative and helps you understand the process. Dave, I have a question. No. Uh, how would you deal with the irrigation of that side yard? I'd probably look and see if I can't work drip in some way. I'd have to find out where my water source is, but maybe put a pipe under the path, or um, you could even come up and go over the top on the pipe and just you know run it down to the ground and put some drip heads along there. So okay. that's probably going to be the best. There's no way to get spray in there, and spray would be ineffective, and you don't want to hand water it, but you do want to get some water to it, and I think the drip would probably be the best solution. So drip coming up over the arch and down the... Yeah. You, you could do it that way, yep. Or putting a pipe with a sleeve underneath if you have to go under the path, and then mm -hmm. popping up and going along the base of that uh, little arbor with some drip heads. Okay. Seems like irrigation is always an issue for me. <laughs> it, you know, in California, it's always an issue. You, you have a great place to grow in, but you have a climate that you know naturally only supports a, a limited palette of plants. If you want to grow everything that you want to grow, you're going to have to think about water. And, you know, you have to think about it very, uh, you know, very carefully and you know, very conservatively now. So, Thank you. You're welcome. What else do you have? How do you go about picking companion plants? You know, I... Again, if I pick companion plants, I usually have the first plant selected. And then what I do is I'm going to look at uh, a palette of plants that they have to match the cultural requirements of the original plant. So again, if it's a cool shady area, you know, I have to have something that's gonna grow in the shade, you know, without, you know, that'll tolerate maybe damp areas. If I have hot sunny areas, you know, I'm, I'm going to look at that. Uh, it, it's kind of funny, but I don't consider soil uh, extensively when I pick plants, just because I know I can probably modify the soil. And I found most plants will grow in any kind of soil, they just don't grow as well. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the aesthetic requirements. And usually whatever that original plant was, I'm going to find something that, if you remember those color schemes in there, I'm going to find something that picks up on one of those. <laughs> Maybe monochromatic. If it's a blue plant, I'm going to pick up something that's different shades of blue. Maybe I'll pick out some purples. Maybe I'll pick out a yellow to contrast it, something complementary. And then I'll go back and take a look at you know size and texture. Okay, uh, do I want something taller, smaller? You know, where is it going to be placed at? And I almost always want something that you know is a different texture. So if it's a coarse leaf plant, I'm going to find something that has uh, a fine leaf plant. Again, when, when you're doing plants, you know, you, you have to be part artist. And I think all of you know that, you know, you, you have plants that you love, but there are certain plants that just don't go with other plants. You know, not only is the, the culture wrong, but, you know, the color might be wrong. Or you've got too many plants that are all the same size, too many plants that are all you know, the same texture, uh, overwhelming with one color. You know, I like to mix it up. And again, if you go back and look at the slideshow, I have Grace send it out to you, and look at that um, mixed border and, you know, see how they pick plants and, and look at the, uh, some of the color palettes that are in there. Those are things that are going to help you pick good companion plants. Um, usually it's going to be in a, a perennial bed somewhere. Okay, maybe a small shrub. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. 
Okay. I have very old magnolias in my front yard and a big lawn. I would like to get rid of the lawn. What do you put under these big magnolias that right now are just dropping leaves like mad that you can get the leaves up and not ruin <laughs> whatever you have underneath? Yeah, but it's a grand floor, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, th those leaves don't decay. They, they have a half-life. Um, you know, that's, that's a challenge. I'd probably put in, uh, again, something that's shade tolerant, and I'd put in something that's going to be uh, durable enough to tolerate running a leaf rake over the top. So it may be that you have to get some decorative grasses. You may have to put some shrubs in. That you'll also find that most of those magnolias, the roots are very close to the surface. Okay, and there, if you had lawn in there, they're probably almost you know on top of the lawn. So you're going to have to pick out you know where you plant them in between the roots. But you don't want anything that's very fragile or very dainty, okay, or requires a lot of sun underneath a magnolia because you will have to go in. And what I've seen people do is just use a leaf rake. To, to kind of pick them up and drag them off the top. Uh, but they're pretty much useless as a mulch. You know, you can't just put them in there. You have to get them out, you know, and grind them or they don't even compost very well. But I don't know if that helps at all. <laughs> I, would I would really like to know what I could put in underneath there that doesn't have to have plants. Oh, that doesn't have to have plant. You mean non-plants underneath? Yes. Oh, just, just you know, what I usually recommend would be um, uh, a wood chip mulch. I've a big seen one. some. Yeah, I've seen some people put, you know, large cobblestones. They they kind of put them in a circle going around to kind of mimic the growth rings on the trees. As they get out towards the edge, they put in, you know, maybe a smaller river rock to kind of give the impression of, you know, you. You're mimicking the, the growth rings and going almost almost all the way out to the drip line, and that's something you could certainly rake. Uh, people always get worried about, well, was water going to get through that? Well, yeah, it is. Uh, they're going to go through down through the stone, and the magnolia will get the moisture that it needs. So, thank you. Yeah, just avo avoid avoid white gravel. Okay. I, 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 have, have, I have a question. Uh huh. Um, I, I have a small area that I'm making into an herb garden and the herbs are all going to be in pots and they are okay. in pots and, and there's a lot of them. And what would you recommend as far as irrigating an area? Would you, I mean, the spray isn't always great. Do you recommend using drip or those little bubbler things or what would you recommend doing for an area like that? Yeah, you, you could use a drip. You could use a, a form of drip they call netafim, N-E-T-A-F-I-M. Yeah, I'm it's, familiar with that. I'm not a fond of, I'm not very fond of it, so. Well, they, they make some now that we actually can put underground and they, they have bubblers, okay? But you can yeah. put it right on the surface if you want to, and then just space bubblers out so you're getting kind of a grid on it. So, yeah, spray only works, you know, it's kind of technical. You have to have the right heads on it. You know, you have to get the lateral lines to it. You know, they have to pop up above the herbs. They tend to put too much water down. You know, if you can get one in each corner of your bed and get it to spray right, you know, it's great. But, you know, a lot of herbs don't even want that much water, so. Well, I think the issue is because they're in pots, all the herbs are in pots, it's it's a little diff oh, more difficult, challenging to run you're, drip you're gonna leave them, You're gonna leave them in pots, right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, again, drip up over the edge into the pot might work. Okay, you have to kind of hide it. I don't know that capillary irrigation will work. That, that's where you kind of have a, a bed around it that's on gravel, and you soak the gravel and let it soak up to the bottom of the pot. But depending on how big your pots are, you know, that might be a little touchy. If they're like in that picture behind you, if they're about that size, that might work, but if they're big, tall pots, uh, the water never seems to get all the way up to the plant. You'd have to hand water for several years to drive the roots down before that capillary action would work. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You, you could try, too, using a, a, a media in the pots. 
that has some sphagnum moss in it that holds onto the water. It's just you don't want to let it dry out because once it dries out, then it's hard to re-wet. But then if you hand water just a little bit, you know, a couple times a week, it might keep them moist enough that's, to grow. That's a good idea. I'll try something like that. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? I didn't mean to go this long. I'm sorry. I, I have a right. question. Um, I have a corner lot and a house that is surrounded on three sides by lawn, which is not very good in these droughty times. And the corner of the lot the, where the streets intersect, there's a huge and beautiful oak tree. And the thing that will grow anywhere on this entire lot is oak seedlings. I have got volunteer oak seedlings, thanks to the squirrels, popping up in everything that I try to plant. Uh, in one case, I just got so tired of trying to keep them under control, I started just shaving them down and pretending it was a boxwood hedge. <laughs> is there any cure? I mean, this is a giant oak tree. I would have thought that it would have just sucked the all the available nutrition and not allowed any of its progeny to thrive, but they seem to be very stubborn. They, again, if they're under the shade of the oak, they probably eventually will get shaded out. They'll never really get very big, but it's a perennial problem. Okay, They're always going to sprout. You know, there, There's enough energy just in that little acorn to probably go for most of a year, so they're going to germinate and they're going to grow for a while. And unless you want to open your own oak nursery, uh, you're probably going to have to mow them down or cut them out. That's mm. there's not a lot of not a lot of uh, prob or issues that, especially if you got squirrels helping you. So mm. no easy cure. One one time I decided I was going to just pull them out when they were little, and I pulled about 250 little oak seedlings about six inches or less out of just underneath this oak tree. And I thought, well, what the hell? I'm never going to get it done. No. <laughs> I found that even if you mulch underneath the oak tree to try to keep the seedlings down, uh, they still bury them underneath the mulch. Yes, so they, they they never they never quit. You know, I've got at least a six inches of oak leaf mulch that has dropped off the tree. I never let anything blow that away. I just want it to be and it, is easy it a, maintenance, whatever. But it, these things is it a coast is it a coast live oak? Yes, it is. Yeah. So then you. You have the challenge of not being able to plant much below it or irrigate anything else to outcompete the oak saplings. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, the only thing else that grows under the oak is California iris, which is also very invasive. It's got little seedlings of California iris all over the place, too. Yeah, so. it'll be the battle of invasive plants after a while. So, I have a question. Yeah. I, re I received a gardenia plant as a gift. Where should I plant the gardenia? Oh, it'll take uh, full sun. It'll take part shade. Uh, it grows in a wide range of soils. A little better if it has, you know, part of, you know, four or five hours of sun a day. I, I think the secret to gardenias is plant them a little high, and once you plant it, uh, don't move it. Its roots don't mm -hmm. like to be disturbed. But they, you know, they're a challenge to get started. Okay, you just have to take care of them. But once they're established, uh, you know, probably the most beautiful fragrance on a flower that you're you're going to find. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, Grace. Yes. Hello, Grace. Um, Hello, I'm here. If if I was successful at recording this, I will email the link to you. And it Great. should be there for a couple more weeks if they want to log in and, and they can download this discussion. I, I started it after we got going, so I don't know exactly how well it's going to work. But. That's okay. Um, I will send out the link maybe um, through Chris and as well as the slides if anybody um, needs to examine anything okay. a lot close, more closely. So the slides yeah, I, presented? Are the Pardon? slides that he presented on the what we saw on our screen? That's yeah. correct. Yeah, there's a PDF of that. And again, I know I went kind of fast because I was watching the clock here and I saw it was approaching two. 
I just got started, but if you can read it slowly, it'll be more like what I. <laughs> I have a question with regards to, uh, I think it's called a Brogansia, the um, trumpet trees. I've had one that I've been uh, thought was going to be growing okay. I had it as, uh, it was about two feet or so tall, but it's been several years now. And it's only like about four feet and it kind of alternate looks like it's going to not make it and then make it. Um, it's mostly sun, but some shade. A what I, yeah, we're gonna, what can I do to help it along? You know, I'm not familiar with that plant. I think she she but said Bergmansia. Oh, Bergmansia? Yeah, it's a, I call it the trumpet tree. Oh, the trumpet tree. Yeah, they, they like shady situations and kind of moist. Okay, uh, again, it's, they grow kind of erratically. Uh, you know, if you want to keep it, you know, more of a normal, not an upright spreading form, you probably want to prune it back every year, you know, and maybe even add a little bit of low grade fertilizer to it. Because it does tend to put on, you know, long shoots with a lot of uh, space in between nodes. So. Well, actually, I wanted to get a little, get it taller so it will screen between me and the laborers up the street. Okay. Uh, so more, more moisture, obviously, and maybe a little bit of fertilizer. Moisture and fertilizer would probably be your, your start. Is it in full sun or part sun? Or? Uh, part sun, it gets morning sun, but then it would be in shade uh, because there's a fence right there. It's against the fence. Okay, that should so be all right. Uh, again, they, they're not a real fan of full sun. So you should be all right uh, if it gets afternoon shade. Okay, yeah, it would get that. Thank you. You're welcome. I have hey. um, one, one, my current issue uh, that I'm trying to improve is that I have an area uh, which is in the corner and it's shaded heavily by redwoods, which are about 20 feet away. And it's up against the house, so it's got heavy eaves over it. So I've had no success in growing things there. And I suspect it's because it gets no water in the winter when I've turned the irrigation systems off. And what I'm finding is I'm not seeing much in the nurseries in the way of sh really shade requiring plants. Shade, low water, have you tried ferns? Um, well, I was hoping for something that would grow sort of at least five foot high to give it some, because it's a nasty blank wall. Um, let's see. Oh, really yeah, yeah. Yeah. Turnstromia. What? Turnstromia might work there. Uh, Sar Sarcococa. Yeah, I tried that one. Um, I don't know if you tried any of the azaleas or rhododendrons. Do you think they'll survive with that little sun? Because they'd be lovely. Uh, a, a rhododendron might. Uh, they'll, they'll grow almost in heavy shade and acid soil. Uh, I wonder if it's acid. I don't know. The water might be the issue for that. Well, well if that's irrigation, I think what I've decided is I'm going to have to keep some irrigation through the winter. Because otherwise it's getting nothing with the heavy yeast. Yeah that or, or hand water a little bit and intermittently during the winter you know yeah. just to kind of round it out you know every other week soak it good and yeah might be enough thank you mm -hmm. hey sally do you ever go hiking along the um the creek trails that go from um kind of the spine of the peninsula out to the coast because those have a lot of interesting plants under the redwoods although it's more moist in your area yeah, but that, it that, might that, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to give it a whole bunch of water because everywhere I'd like to give more water. Um, right. But so I was just hoping something that would just just brighten up this rather dull corner um, with some greenery. Maybe if it has a little bit of water, maybe try a, you know, variegated dogwood. Mm -hmm. Oh, wouldn't that be pretty? You know, do you mean the native dogwood, Dave? Or the tree. Do you mean the native dogwood or, or the um, 
Okay. Well, the native one isn't variegated. Uh, oh, okay. It's variegated. Thank you. But it does have red twigs. Again, if you keep pruning it back, the twigs stay red. If you quit pruning it, <laughs> the twigs turn brown with a little bit of red tip on it. Yeah. If you want the variegated, you have to get the cultivated one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. David, I have a question. Mm -hmm. We have a, an, asp, uh, an apple espalier and it's kind of growing out of control. Is it okay to prune it right now when it's, you know, producing some it's apples? Yeah, yeah, you can prune it anytime. In fact, you, you know, a lot of times if you, with apples, you have to go in and actually, you know, pull some fruit off so it doesn't get too heavy. You just want to watch out. You know, you can prune it back quite a ways, but just protect the, the, the fruiting spurs on there. And they look like little stacks of pancakes. Okay. I still remember my dad going through and, you know, he was pruning his apple tree and he was cutting all those off. I'm going to get rid of these little twiggy things. But no, dad, that's where your fruit comes from. You know, leave the little <laughs> spurs on there, you know, and prune the other things that, that grow. So, but yeah, you can, you can cut it back. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I hear my grandchildren have returned from the rock. <laughs> well, I think I think we're probably ready to call it uh, at the end. Thank okay. you so much. We really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you for your support of Foothill College, and there'll be a new instructor to support next year. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Enjoy your retirement. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks much.